Welcome to Clause 8, the voice of IP. Clause 8 is part of IP Watchdog and hosted by Eli Mazur. If you enjoy listening, please subscribe on your favorite podcasting app, share it with others, and leave a five-star rating. This episode features an interview with Professor Adam Mossoff from George Mason University's Scalia Law School. He is the leading academic expert when it comes to intellectual property policy issues. Most significantly, he is largely responsible for providing the intellectual foundation that has helped shift the anti-patent narrative in Washington, D.C. There's a good chance that you've come across as many op-eds on IP issues in publications such as the Wall Street Journal or have seen his engaging testimony at congressional hearings. On this episode, Eli and Professor Mossoff talk about how law school professors influence the patent policy debate the divide among conservatives and libertarians on IP issues, the Supreme Court's approach to patent cases, how the patent system is helping America battle the COVID-19 pandemic, and much more. The reason I wanted to interview you is because when I started practicing in this field, I found there was a lot of academics, papers, and studies, and talk on Capitol Hill and Supreme Court decisions that didn't really match up with what I was seeing in my patent practice. And once in a while, I would come across your op-ed, your article in a general interest papers or a conservative publication, and I'd say, well, this actually makes a lot of sense and jives with what I'm seeing in practice. And you really help shape the way I think about IP and patent issues, so it's really a pleasure to talk with you today about them. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. So so I, I guess the one question that I like to start out with is just asking, do you remember when you first became aware of patents? And did you have any impression of the role they played when you did? You're asking a bit about my, uh, what is now, from my perspective, ancient history. (laughs) So, because I'm a tech geek, going back to the 1980s, in fact, when I teach my intellectual property courses, uh, kind of establishing my street cred with the students, I, I mentioned how I was chiseling code by hand on stone tablets when they were all babes in diapers. I very delightfully had a student about eight years ago inform me that he wasn't born yet. <laughs> so I shouldn't be referring to him as a babe in diaper at that time. So as I mentioned, and people who know me well know that I'm, I, I'm a geek in every respect of the term. I'm, I happily embrace it. I'm a firm believer in embracing who you are, not fighting who you are. So I've always been interested in technology and science. And this combined with, I actually have also for a very long time, reaching back to my teenage years, I've had an interest in philosophy and theory and political theory in particular. And so I actually originally was going to go into philosophy and I was going to be a legal philosopher. So in the 90s, when I was in graduate school, I combined my interests in philosophy at the time with my interests in technology and my, in my geekdom more generally. And I became very interested in the general development of the concept of property as it evolved historically and, into, and philosophically over, over the centuries through the Western canon, and in particular, how kind of intellectual property came to fall within this general concept as well, starting in the 18th and 19th centuries. And so uh, it kind of, from my perspective, intellectual property kind of brought together really some really cool aspects of what it means to study not just theory and concepts and ideas, but also to study the more, even more importantly, how those ideas are applied in the real world, where the theoretical rubber meets the practical, institutional, commercial, and legal road. And so it took me a while to realize that being in philosophy, I was still too far divorced from the real world, even doing legal philosophy. And so I switched over to law school and becoming a law professor. And um, the rest is uh, more recent history, <laughs> so, is, which is how you discovered my work. <laughs> a little bit more about back, your background. I saw that you went to University of Chicago Law School and you were actually a research assistant with uh, Richard Epstein, who's obviously a very well-known legal scholar. And until recently myself, I didn't know about his interest in patent issues. Is that what you worked with him on? And I'm guessing it wasn't coincidence that you ended up being his research assistant. (laughs) No, it wasn't a coincidence at all. Richard was one of the reasons why I wanted to go to the University of Chicago Law School because I I knew of his work and and many other people at the University of Chicago Law School as well at, at that time, but him in particular. And so I was very lucky. I was able to have him as a professor. At that time, I 
knew him and, and referred to him, of course, as Professor Epstein, not as Richard. He has now since become a colleague and a men, uh, not just a mentor and a professor, but a colleague and a friend. And in fact, I took patent law from Richard. <laughs> he likes to point this out. He says it was the first time and the last time I taught patent law. <laughs> Adam Laza was in the front row of my class. <laughs> and I really enjoyed, of course, patent law with him. I mean, he, R- Richard is a walking one-man law school. I mean, he, he rotates through the entire curriculum. 1L curriculum at, at University of Chicago and continues to do that at NYU where he's now where he's now based. One of the things that really appealed to me about Richard, of course, is his commitment to classical liberalism, which I share, and his recognition of how you need to structure legal institutions and legal doctrines to serve the ideals of classical liberalism, protecting the rights of life, liberty, and property, and laying the foundations for what makes possible not just flourishing individual lives, but a flourishing society. And he, to his credit, recognizes that intellectual property is part and parcel of that package of institutions and legal rights that that make possible a flourishing life for people and, and societies more generally, which is not something that one always finds among libertarians and other classical liberals. There are many people in that space who are very critical of IP, but Richard stands out in, in, in as a as a unique individual who understands and in why intellectual property evolved and 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 the benefits that we derive from it. I was going to ask you a little later, but I think it's. Relevant now, there does seem to be this divide, even on the conservative legal side, between those like you and uh, Richard Epstein who believe that intellectual property should be treated like property rights versus people like Paul Clement, who's obviously was often named as a future Supreme Court nominee at one point. And he's obviously a sincere conservative, but he comes to this issue from a completely different side where he says it's not only not a property right. There's no basis for it in common law or natural law. Let's just figure out what's the best to get rid of these pen trolls. Maybe I'm <laughs> being too flip with this argument, but what leads people on the conservative legal side to come to these different conclusions? Oh, that's a, that's a really great question. Because intellectual property doesn't fall along the traditional left-right liberal conservative divide that one sees either in politics or in law, even among kind of people who believe in textualism and originalism versus kind of living constitutionalism and purposivism within kind of judicial philosophies, which don't necessarily map onto a left-right political divide. But nonetheless, one finds intellectual property positions to be quite diverse with even across that divide. So for instance, on the U.S. Supreme Court right now, the two people who are probably share the most similar views with respect to intellectual property uh, in terms of being very critical of intellectual property, viewing intellectual property as a monopoly interest, as something that is in derogation of kind of core rights, that needs to be viewed very skeptically and limited is uh, Justice Breyer on the one hand and Justice Thomas on the other, two justices that one does not normally find joining together on many issues <laughs> on the U.S. Supreme Court, but they nonetheless share this view of, of patents and copyrights. And so it tends to be a split issue, as I mentioned, on the right, among right-of-center politicians and, and among people who normally share similar judicial philosophies. It's unfortunate. A lot of it is just a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding of the history of how intellectual property evolved. You mentioned, for instance, and as I just described it, some people view it as just a, a grant from the government, a statutory grant as distinct from our, quote, common law rights, unquote, and, and land and other things. That's actually mistaken. The historical evolution of, of our rights and property rights in land involves a mixture of both statutory grants from parliament <laughs> as well as judicial decisions, just as much as our intellectual property rights have evolved through both a mixture of statutory grants and judical decisions, as, as you well know, Eli. Uh, <laughs> we, we read and apply these decisions in our work on a day-to-day basis. And then there's also kind of a theoretical contest as occurs, which reflects in my mind kind of a vibrancy of debate among classical liberals and libertarians and conservatives about the nature of society and political institutions. There's people who think, well, you know, the point of individual rights is uh, or property rights in particular is to resolve disputes. And so since IP inventions and, and books are not inherently rivalrous and things of that sort, then you don't have conflicts over these things, and ergo, you, you don't need rights. Whereas other people take them kind of a, another approach, myself and Richard and others, where you say, well, where do these values come from in the first place? They have to be created, and not, and not just created. And in fact, all values, all property has to be created, even property rights in land 
right? One doesn't go out into the forest and find a mechanized reaper or and the ability to plant wheat or to build a farmhouse or to build a tractor. I mean, these things had to be invented. But not just that these things have to be created, but they have to be secured to their people who create them, because otherwise people won't create if they're not. But even more importantly, and this is why intellectual property correlates in the 19th century with the rise of the Industrial Revolution and capitalism, is that then you have to facilitate and provide the mechanism by which these creations get deployed in the marketplace, get converted into products and services that can be manufactured and produced and by industrialists and manufacturers and transferred through the, the value chain to retailers, wholesalers, and sold to consumers as products and services and within a very vibrant innovation economy that is growing and flourishing. And the way you do that, as economists and classical liberals have recognized for a very long time, is through property rights. And that is the function of property rights. In this respect, you know, modern intellectual property patents, copyrights, they're not monopolies. All property rights originally evolved out of monopolies. People like to point out the fact that patents and copyrights originally were grants from the crown. Well, that's true of rights and land. Rights and land were originally royal grants and what, uh, from the crown. But the key to the evolution of what made rights and land property was that they shifted into what we now understand as a property right, which is something which not just secures to you the fruits of your productive labors, but secures to you your ability to then deploy those productive labors in contracts and other types of exchanges in the marketplace. A great insight of Adam Smith that division of labor and specialization is what drives flourishing economies. I just want to also comment that you know Paul Clement is an interesting figure in this. You referenced his recent paper where he criticized patents as monopolies. Well, I guess I was surprised... Why is he writing an academic paper out of all topics? Why is he all of a sudden interested in this? Right. Well, that paper was commissioned by a uh, lobbying organization known as the High Tech Innovation Alliance, which is an organization that was formed by the group of big tech companies that now goes by the acronym of FANG in the DC policy debates, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and others, that has been long lobbying and advocating on behalf of restricting or eliminating IP rights. And so Paul Clement was writing that not as a conservative scholar, he was writing that as a lawyer. And the best indication of that is that he wrote a paper on copyright about 11 years ago called The Constitutional Foundations of Copyright that said the exact opposite of his paper that he just published on patent law. <laughs> and that earlier paper about seven or eight years ago was also you know, commissioned by a different organization at that time. But in this earlier paper, Constitutional Foundations of Copyright, he relies upon both patent cases in the early 19th century, as well as, uh, as copyright cases to argue that copyrights are natural rights, pre-existing constitution, deserve to be protected and secured to their innovators. And now because he's being paid money by a different client, has argued to the exact opposite on patents, using inciting to different patent cases to make this case. And it's funny because I, I've seen that paper cited in many different places without that link being made. So that's an interesting insight into how that... <laughs> Yeah, it's unfortunate that it's not really widely known, the genesis of that paper. It's a very short little issue paper that one would expect to see. There's nothing wrong with people writing issue papers and deploying them in the policy debates. All organizations do this, all people do this, but it just the paper should be explicit that this is a paper that is being pushed by a particular organization and group on behalf of their advocacy position. Yeah. I think we'll talk a little bit more about how the sausage is made, I guess, in D.C. But uh, going back to the Supreme Court about, you know, you, you described the philosophical divide really well. But even if you look at, you know, their approach to, you know, Justice Scalia, who was a namesake of your law school, and Justice Thomas, how they approach patent cases is, in some ways, they wouldn't ever approach any other case like that. And, you know, an example is Section 101, where they're very comfortable creating these judicial exceptions that are not in the statute. They're very comfortable with policy arguments in support of them and so forth. How do you explain that? I've heard of theories where I had another guest tell me that they lived through the Blackberry patent wars and they were afraid they're going to lose their Blackberries. But I, I don't know if that's kind of a compelling, I don't know if you have any theories about that. Uh, <laughs> I am not particularly receptive to those types of arguments where, oh, well, because they're at core, they're kind of, they're legal realist arguments. That's just another version of the classic legal realist argument from the 1920s that judges decide cases based upon what they had for breakfast that morning. On the margins, and in perhaps in some cases, there are judges who act for reasons outside of their particular judicial philosophies or political philosophies. 
I tend to view people as motivated by their, their ideas, judges and justices and scholars and commentators, because lawyers who are paid to do lawyers' work, right, are motivated by their clients and, and their money, which is, by the way, perfectly fine too. This is our division of labor, it's a specialization of society. It is a bit odd that someone who is committed originalist and a committed textualist would come to the views that he has, when we're talking here about Justice Thomas, about intellectual property. Although the views that he has adopted have been the kind of the dominant conventional wisdom, especially within the academy for a very long time about intellectual property. And there has been at least a vibrant policy debate about status and nature of intellectual property going back to the early years of this country. So, you know, the dominant approach by the courts and other government officials, as I have been exploring in my research for a very long time, ha- you know, was to treat these legal rights as property rights and to define them generally as such. But there was a broad d- debate. They've been a part of and parcel of a larger debate about the role of property rights and contract rights and, and other types of economic rights more generally within our society from the very get-go. And so one can find, of course, citations and in, in some court decisions and commentators' positions that support the view that patents are these monopoly grants, that they should be viewed very suspiciously, and you know that they're this, this carrot that we dangle in front of inventors who wouldn't invent but for the fact that we have to kind of dangle this carrot in front of them, like which I really dislike because it kind of this kind of utilitarian framing of this just about incentives really kind of treats inventors and innovators and creators like they're mice. And we have to put, to put little little treats in front of them where they won't do what we want them to do as society, which is just not, not the case at all. You want to secure to people the fruits of their productive labors more generally. And this is the, the view that our society embraced, our country embraced. This is what made the American experiment so unique and exceptional. This is American exceptionalism from you know from the get-go of our limited government and the protection of rights, life, the rights of life, liberty, and property. So it is a bit odd that he's done this, but I you know I, I largely see him as kind of being caught up in this kind of conventional wisdom within the academy and among many commentators about the nature of intellectual property and also conventional wisdom that's embraced by a lot of our youth today, thanks to the internet and things of this sort. And you have out-of-context historical sources that he can point to and identify at times that provide some justification for it. But, you know, he's a very busy person. I mean, he, he doesn't just think about patents. I mean, he, he hear cases in all matters of con law and, and, legal, and our legal system more generally. And so, I, you know, I would love to sit down with him and be able to talk with him about these issues if I ever had the opportunity or chance. But he's got a lot of things he's thinking about. And so, you know, I don't necessarily fault him for that either. So... There's a, an interesting, maybe a coincidence, or, you know, Leonard Leo, who was a executive director uh, of the Federalist Society, you know, he, for some, he's a hero or a villain, depending on who you say, but he's credited with creating this, you know, this pipeline of conservative or judges who have a conservative approach to, to deciding cases. And he's actually, personally, he's a strong advocate of patent rights. But within that pipeline, Gorsuch, I guess, was a success but I'm guessing that's not something that he prioritizes. It's a kind of a coincidence. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's something that patent scholars, and some copyright people, well, and other people in the intellectual property space complain about that, oh, you know, not enough attention is given to the intellectual property when you think about you know, who these judges and justices are. Right, well, because they're th- they, they're, if you think about it, I mean, what dominates kind of the broader policy debates in this country? It's not our patent system, <laughs> right? And so, you know, they're focused much more on kind of foundational questions, of, you know, about the regulatory state, about the administrative state, about the nature of what types of rights are secured under the Constitution and things of that sort. And so I don't fault them for that. In fact, one can find people in every spe- area of specialization complaining that that particular area of law that they do, whether it's bankruptcy, whether it's telecommunications law, whether it's tax law, the court doesn't fully appreciate the complexities of, of this area and they're, and they're doing more damage than good. So it's always kind of interesting to hear patent scholars complain about this and, and act like this is something that's unique to us when it's not. Actually, it's unique to all areas of specialization. And so it's not surprising. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the reason I was asking is, well, what is the hope of changing that in the future? Or maybe there, there isn't and it's just going to be random luck. Well, the number of times that a U.S. Supreme Court justice has said, oh, a decision that I wrote four years ago or five years ago on behalf of a substantial majority, if not a unanimous Supreme Court, so 
Thomas's decision in Alice, for instance, which was unanimous, or his decision in oil states, which is on behalf of seven justices. The number of times that that's happened in history is zero. And it's understandable. I mean, they, they wrote that decision. They believe in it. And so part of it is not being so hyper-focused on just the Supreme Court. We have other branches of our government, co-equal branches, uh, <laughs> separation of powers. And this is, a, in fact, a very important area, an important point to remember, because the Supreme Court is not engaging in constitutional interpretation here. They're interpreting the statutes that have been enacted by Congress under Congress's authorization in the Constitution, in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, to create a patent system and create a copyright system. So we can go to Congress and we should go to Congress and, and say, uh, the Supreme Court has misinterpreted and screwed up the laws that you've written. And so you need to amend the laws to make it clear that the laws don't mean what the Supreme Court just said they do. And this happens in all areas of our, our legal and political system. Congress has done this many times with respect to the civil rights statutes and I don't know, the protection statutes where there have been Supreme Court decisions that people haven't been unhappy with. They've gone back to Congress and said, change the statute to abrogate this Supreme Court decision. And so we should be going to Congress and talking with the, the executive branch as well, because it's not just it's not just the Supreme Court that's engaging in bad decisions. There have been some really bad actions in the past 10 to 15 years in the space, especially of antitrust at the FTC and the DOJ, that have really unsettled and undermined these kind of effective and reliable property rights and innovation that have driven our innovation economy. Tell me if I'm wrong. What I'm hearing you saying is if you care about these issues, you know, for stronger patent rights, stop hoping that the Supreme Court will magically realize it's wrong and reverse itself there's a much better chance of that the Congress and the executive branch will kind of. Well, go and right there's a, and so yes, the, in part, but also recognize that it's not just an issue of political lobbying or judicial lobbying, so to speak, as well, in terms of engaging in strategic litigation campaigns. It's in part also an educational campaign. It's in part an important part about taking on and countering the conventional wisdom, because as long as that conventional wisdom stands unchallenged, that the patent system is broken. All these cliches that we hear that, you know, you find a billion hits on if you Google them, you know, the phrase patent troll and patent holdup and all these terms that have been coined by the skeptics of patents or companies who have business models that are driven by diminished or weakened IP rights and thus are lobbying to push these terms in the policy debates. You know, as long as those terms and the conventional wisdom stands unchallenged, then we're not going to make any other progress or, or headway. And so we have to counter that with rigorous fact-based scholarship, positive scholarship that shows, you know, you know, IP has been foundational to not just a growing innovation economy from the 19th century today, but to a flourishing society. It's my own historical and theoretical research. Uh, you know, I believe through that, you know, over the years that intellectual property rights are right morally, economically. History shows this. And we actually have the high ground. We shouldn't be on the defense reacting to, we shouldn't be responding to people like Paul Clement's paper. We should be developing our positive case for IP. And on the basis of that, that's where I see my role. I'm not an advocate. I, you know, I'm a scholar. And so my job is to produce that rigorous database scholarship that other people, other advocates, lawyers such as yourself and other people can take into the legal and policy debates. As I was preparing for this interview, I actually read a post by Josh Blackman, who's a professor now and a former student at George Mason. And the topic was, why do law professors do what they do? And I kind of wanted to ask that. And obviously, you know, you stress the importance of scholarship. But you're not one of those professors who just writes academic papers for other professors. You're obviously interested in the public policy debates. You write for general interest publications. You talk to Congress. How do you decide what specific issues to focus on within the IP policy debates? And then also, how do you decide, should I publish an academic article? Should I do an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal? How, how does that process work? Oh, yeah. And as I mentioned, kind of going back to your very first question at the start of our interview, one of the reasons why I chose to become a law professor and cross the divide from academic philosophy to law school was because, you know, I'm very much interested in ideas and theories and the justifications for why we have political uh, institutions and legal doctrines. But I'm interested in those because 
in part because they're applied in the real world. They make a difference in the real world, in people's lives. And so one of the reasons why I became a professor and an academic is because I really wanted to explore and develop these ideas further that provide that foundation for lawyers, government officials, judges to then be able to, in their respective capacities, take those ideas and take that information and data and deploy it in ways to to further a better society. I think that's true of every person who becomes a law professor in some respect, that we care about these ideas and we care about how these ideas are deployed in the real world. So we're not just writing for another 50 or so academics who just happen to study Hegel's phenomenology or, or Kant's critique of pure reason or something. So I see myself as a kind of serving it in a, a very important kind of reserve capacity, you know, or support capacity, kind of in a tier of people through kind of a version of what Adam Smith talked about in in his Wealth of Nations through specialization and division of labor. A job of a lawyer or a job of a policy analyst or a job of a judge is not to become an expert in a whole, you know, in a particular field and drill down into it and know all of the historical details and everything of that sort. They can't. They can't do what they do and and do this, right? We have to have division of labor. We have to have specialization. It's what makes possible having a flourishing society. So I try to think about, okay, well, where, you know, what are the areas that are important that should be explored? So, you know, when I first became an academic, there were a lot of people going around talking about historically patents were always viewed as monopolies. And they would cite to this letter, but famous letter or infamous letter, from my perspective, by Thomas Jefferson in 1813. And they were just, I noticed that that was kind of the go-to site. And there was very few other kind of sites or quotations for this kind of historical claim. And historical claims carry a lot of weight in a common law system where we rely on precedent and where judges care about things like originalism and, and textualism and the meaning of legal text as they originally were written. So I said, well, that's really interesting. Let me let me go back and read the historical sources. So I then read every patent decision uh, in the 19th century in the Federal Cases Reporter. It's about, it's about 1,500 of them or so. And uh, found, well, actually, Jefferson, while his views were part and parcel of a broader policy debate, was really kind of actually in terms of the actual application of the ideas, was on the minority side of a majority-minority split between legal doctrines, so to speak, to use a metaphor. And that's what led to my other, you know, articles that I wrote historically on the protection of patents under the Takings Clause in the 19th century, and my other article titled, Who Cares What Thomas Jefferson Thought About Patents? <laughs> yes, <laughs> as kind of a kind of humorous response to this kind of constant invocation of Jefferson. And then as, as I wrote those articles and people started to come to me and saying, yeah, this is really great. Now take this scholarship and make it accessible to someone who doesn't have time to read a 60-page article. <laughs> so I said, all right, so I'll, I'll write shorter, you know, white papers, issue papers, I'll write op-eds. And then, of course, you know, you start to see lot, there's lots of interconnected issues. And so when you become a senior professor, you become, you start to have a balance in your work between kind of the ongoing scholarship you're doing on the one hand, and then op-eds and issue papers and white papers and things of that sort that you're doing on the other. But they're interlinked with each other. My scholarship informs and supports and drives my op-eds and my white papers and issue papers and vice versa, where I'm showing kind of, not only do you have these kind of abstract ideas and historical data, it matters because it matters to current policy debates. So for instance, right now I'm, I'm doing this massive historical study. I'm rereading all those patent cases from the 19th century for the injunctions analysis, because thanks to the eBay decision and the Federal Circuit's really horrendous interpretation of what eBay meant and just broad misunderstandings of, of eBay, and eBay itself was wildly mistaken, I am kind of exploring and kind of understand better how injunctions were issued in the protection of patents in the 19th century. Because eBay was wrong when it said this four-factor test is historical, a historical test. There is no four-factor test in, in historical. I can say that with absolute certainty. But I can only say that because I'm reading the cases. I'm reading all the cases. And so that's kind of the, the broader view. But I don't think I'm unique in that. I think, you know, this is kind of part and parcel of what all law professors do at some level or another. Even, you know, and we just kind of all are kind of balancing to various degrees how much we want to do scholarship and how much we want to do other types of more legal or policy work. And you mentioned that when you were writing these academic papers, people were coming to you and say, you know, write something more accessible. Was it groups that lobby on behalf of stronger patent rights or who, I guess, is asking you to do that? Or how does that work? Yeah, it was a mixture. So some of it was organizations and entities that said, hey, you know, this is really cool, interesting work you're doing. Have you thought about 
how this might apply to these current issues. I was originally kind of a heads, total heads. I started out as kind of a total heads in the clouds academic, <laughs> coming from philosophy, of course. So originally I was like, oh, wow, that's really fascinating. This is really cool that this work I'm doing on the intellectual history of how, for instance, natural rights philosophy deeply informed and guided the development of intellectual property as an actual legal doctrine in this in, in, in this country, which runs 100% counter to the conventional wisdom in both the academy and in policy circles that this is an entirely utilitarian system that we embrace just for just because it, it promotes overall social welfare. And so I then started to kind of explore these issues and realized, oh yeah, there actually there are people who are interested in hearing these these views and who rightly don't have the time to read a sixty page law review article and shouldn't be reading a sixty page law review article. They have better things to do with their time. They have better, more important, valuable th- things to do with their time, given what they do. And I realized if what drove me to become a law professor is I care about the application of these ideas in the real world, I should also kind of take that next step and kind of work on op eds and things of that sort to get these ideas out into the real world, not and not just leave them at the domain of the I- academic ivory tower. The reason I was asking is because obviously for these organizations like HTIA, for example, it would be very valuable for them to have a law professor who's willing to do these kinds of things. But obviously as an academic, you know, you have your own priorities from both sides. You know, what advice would you give to an organization that wants to find allies in the academia? What advice would you give to younger professors to kind of how to be how to navigate that? Okay, that's a really great question because law professors are also uniquely situated in that we're lawyers <laughs> as well. And we are keyed into kind of broader policy and legal debates in ways that other academics aren't. And as you said, organizations do depend on and rely on broader intellectual work to drive their their arguments. And that's true on both sides of the debate, right? So, you know, one of the kind of most prominent policy arguments on behalf of the patent troll narrative that has dominated the the DC policy debates about patents for the past 10 or 10 years was this study done in 2011 that so-called non-practicing entities, patent trolls, you know, caused $29 billion in cost in the year 2011. And that's an example of policy advocates taking academic work. Of course, in that case, that was a study that was prompted by RPX and relied upon their private data set. And so when Besson, uh, Jim Besson and, and Mike Moyer took that data set, no one had access to their data to double check it. And there have been lots of academic studies, articles that have been done on that study that have shown that it's a junk science study, that by any kind of basic economic or statistical standards you know, that one would apply in assessing those types of studies, that like, one should never rely on that study. But nonetheless, it was deeply pushed by companies and interest groups that cared about pushing the patent troll narrative. And it came to just dominate and became true through repetition. And so there is a concern here because you know, organizations can seek out like Paul Clement's work to you know, deploy work that you know, is really advocacy work. Also, there are law professors who work as lawyers who represent clients and haven't disclosed to that in the policy debates. You know, historically, they do now, but they haven't in the past. And you just need to be very, you know, you, if you're doing something like that, you know, if you are actually representing clients and you're not clearly differentiating work as lawyer, as advocate on behalf of client and work as scholar and academic, because I'm interested in finding out the truth about something or I believe in something because of an independent thought process that I've gone through where I really come to believe through my own rigorous analytical assessment that this is something I really believe, that you need to make sure that you keep those distinct from each other. And we as law professors, unlike other, I think other academics, other economists and, and statisticians and others probably have some similar type of concerns, you know, people may not respect those boundaries. So if you're a junior scholar, you have to be very careful that you make very clear when you are wearing your advocacy hat and when you are wearing your academic hat and be very clear when the two are distinct. As I said, there are some very prominent professors who have not done that. And it's really unfortunate and it's a shame. And as people come to you and say, hey, you know, I want you to do X, right? You have to say to yourself, well, what role are you asking me to do this in? You should always disclose whether you're being paid or working on behalf of someone. And in what way am I deploying or thinking about my scholarship such that it doesn't get intertwined with the, the policy or legal, legal work that you may be doing as a lawyer? But it's very important. I th- I, the most important thing is to keep these categories distinct and separate, both in your work and in even the way you think about these things. 
And it's funny, you actually mentioned I was going to touch upon that study about the 29 billion, but it seems there's a whole genre of these studies that get a lot of attention. They make these statistical claims, you know, the patents are costing America's economy, like you said, 29 billion. AIA and the PTAB are saving America's economy 3 billion. Half of the patents are bad patents. And then you see, obviously, you know, some scholarship pushing back on that. But, you know, as a patent attorney or even as, as an ordinary citizen, how do you grapple with like claims like that and studies like that? Do you have any th thoughts about that? Because, you know, for a journalist, they see something like that. It's an easy article for them to write to get a lot of attention. But when, like you said, if you start digging into it, you know, a lot of times it's not as the acrobatics they have to do to get there aren't as clear as it seems. Yeah. And that's part of the problem is that, so you get a lot of, for lack of a better term, you know, junk science, bogus claims made. Patent trolls cost $29 billion in damage in 2011, which is a total junk claim by any academic metric. And the recent study by the showing the PTAB has benefited the economy has a lot of the similar types of problems as that $29 billion claim it does. And then what happens then is, is that good academics who you know believe in just, well, what does the data say? We should be doing rigorous data-driven studies that show actually what is happening in the world. Spend their time because it takes time to do these, right? Like I said, I'm rereading every you know patent case in the 19th century, you know, assessing the injunctions analysis, putting together my data set. That takes a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of time to just throw together some junk science study. <laughs> you, you know, take, it's easy to mix stuff up. <laughs> so it takes a lot of time. And then you publish it in an academic journal and no one reads it. I mean, so like, as I mentioned, like there were several incredible scholarly takedowns of that $29 billion number that just, you know, ripped it to shreds uh, because it was very easy to do because it just violated so many requirements and basic standards, you know, academic norms for doing statistical or economic analysis. And yet none of those were read. <laughs> you know, no one knows about those because that wasn't because the, you know that that was that was an academic debate and that occurred in the academic literature and never made a you know a dent in the policy world or the policy literature. So you know, part and parcel of this is to keep, I believe, and in, in fact, this was expressed to me at a conference once. I you know, so about ten years ago, I was at a conference at the University of Pennsylvania where a very prominent patent law professor was on another panel. And on this panel, he made some historical claims about the patent system in the 19th century. And I was really surprised to hear this because what he had said, I had never heard or seen. At that time, I had just published my Who Cares What Thomas Jefferson Cares About Patents and my Constitutional Protections of Patents from the Takings Clause and other historical pieces because I had been deeply imbued in the 19th century patent uh, jurisprudence. So I went up to this professor after the panel. And I said, you know, what you said was really fascinating. I had never heard this. So can you point me to the sources where it says this? And he said, well, no, you can, you prove it wrong. I said, as first, I said, you know, well, look, my research agenda as, as a professor is not to be your fact checker, but from this professor's perspective, that's exactly what I was supposed to do. So I was, just, so then I was supposed to spend the next several years of my life, you know, proving the, this, this offhand remark wrong. Meanwhile, this professor was going on to make other claims and other assertions. It keeps me on the defensive. So then me, as a, as a scholar, I'm not engaging in a positive research agenda where I'm explaining through data-driven rigorous scholarship how patents and other intellectual property rights provide a foundation for not just innovators and creators to create what they do, but to deploy them in the marketplace and to drive a flourishing society. I'm instead responding to why X claim is wrong, which no one reads. Because by the time I finish that two or three years later, after having done my rigorous research of the historical records or in the data, this particular professor and other policy advocates are on to their next claims or their 10 claims after that. So in other words, kind of to use a sports metaphor that I sometimes use, right? You know, we're kept on the defense, never going offense. And moreover, we're kept on the defense, like on the, the two yard line. <laughs> so it's a losing proposition. And so I decided back, back then, after that experience and others that were that kind of confirmed this, that I would stop being reactive. I would stop doing reactive scholarship. I would stop doing responsive yeah. scholarship because that lets the patent skeptics set the terms at the very terms of the debate. We should let them set the terms of the debate. We have a positive case to make ourselves based upon the data 
and the economics and the history and the moral theory. And I think we should spend our time doing that. And that's why I've spent my energies directed to doing these things, founding an IP center at, at George Mason that I've since passed on to someone else and you know, engaging in, in doing work in other fields and in other institutions because I'm very interested in, in not being reactive but making the positive case, because I think there is a positive case to be made after I had done the research and thought about these issues for a long time. Yeah. And, and that's an interesting story about the professor, because, you know, usually when a layman hears a professor say something, they take it at face value that it's well-grounded, that the professor is being sincere, but that's not always the case. <laughs> Professors are humans just yeah. like any others. And we all make mistakes. I mean, I, I, but we all can make mistakes because we're not infallible. And we also share other human vices. And, and so I think it's very important, you know, to be very sensitive to work that is shaped by or infor- fundamentally informed by, not by an academic stance on something, but by an advocacy stance on something. And there are a lot of law review articles that represent that. One example is, you know, this very you know, famous article on patent holdup theory that was published in 2007 by Mark Lemley and Carl Shapiro, which kind of cr- drove the antitrust authorities for a very long time. It's an article that con- consists entirely of a model, a model that has, and other academics have pointed out problems with this model, that patent holdup will happen. And they made actually very specific predictions about what they think would happen in the smartphone industry. Predictions, by the way, that have not come true. And moreover, all of the empirical research in the past 10 years has contradicted the patent holdup theory. It's, it's purely just a theory. It was a hypothesis that was predicted by, uh, it was a hypothesis about what will happen in the marketplace given a model. That model has yet to find a single empirical verification. And not just not a single empirical verification, the empirical studies that have sought to confirm or refute this model repeatedly have found contrary evidence. So what one expect to see, for instance, in the smartphone industry if patent holdup was a systemic problem is the market dynamics that one would expect to see, one must see are increased prices, fewer entrants into the marketplace, and less innovation. So fewer new introduction of new products and services. Well, what has what has typified the smartphone industry the past 10 years? Actually, some of the fastest decreased quality adjusted prices, if you adjust for quality control, the fastest decrease in prices in, in any area of the sector of the economy, a massive increase in innovation in new products and services with what new phones coming out like every, what, 10 months and new entrants, constant new entrants. And yet the antitrust authorities singularly focused on this theory, said, oh, this theory must be true and started adopting regulations and policies on the basis of this theory to the harm of actual innovators. Now, what a lot of people don't know is if you go back and re- look at the foot, you know, the site, you know, the source of when this article was produced, it explicitly says it was produced at the, you know, with support from Intel <laughs> and other companies, other companies that had been also pushing for and benefiting from not just in the policy advocacy and lobbying, but in actual litigation using this article. And so I think, you know, that, that combined should tell you that that article is not just a, a, a valid piece of scholarship one should just be citing to as having proven a theory that is not proven. And that's interesting because even once it's disproven, some people still hold on to some of those beliefs. Like I heard, you know, that's a good example about hold up. The FTC chairman says, well, yeah, I'm halfway between hold up or not hold up. You know, I'm, I don't believe it as much as I used to, but I still, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard to let go, I guess, once you're uh, Yeah, well, I was at a conference five years ago or six years ago in D.C., it was a public conference where, you know, the current, where Renata has the then current, you know, head of the antitrust division of the DOJ, one of the, or, yeah, at that time, the division that had grappled with and taken on a patent holdup as a concern, and they thought we need to address this, where she was asked very specifically at this conference, well, what's the evidence for patent holdup, you know, that you have to justify adopting these positions and, and bringing cases and regulatory enforcement actions, as well as cases. And her response was twofold. Her uh, one response was that people have come to me and have said, I've been held up. And she said, and I can't disclose what they are because of you know, confidentiality requirements, which of course is true, but that's an inherently problematic claim. But, you know, and then she said, well, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, you have to do what you know is right in your heart of hearts. <laughs> and again, that's, is that what we want our government officials saying? I have to, I want to do what's right in my heart of hearts. Evidence? No. In response to evidence, I have my heart that's telling me that this is right. Uh, no, we want 
policy based on evidence. We want you know data driven, evidence based policy, and that's what we have not had. And it's unfortunate. And the reason why patent holdup came to be so dominant was because it was you had this scholarly looking article by professors who was then pushed very effectively by advocacy, and that's that's how it works on all sides. But you know you've had a lot of advocacy. You know the you know the back of the envelope calculations that some people have made is you know you know well over a million dollars was spent lobbying for just just to try to pass the the bill known as the Innovation Act, which was another piece of legislation driven by the patent troll narrative. And that legislation didn't get passed because universities and individual inventors and other stakeholders in the innovation economy who rely upon patents in their business models in both the high tech space and the biopharmaceutical space finally kind of finally got together and had access to and made the points to congresspersons that this would actually damage them and harm them and harm the innovation economy. And I'm not sure if it was about that act, but a memorable moment for me, you, you, like I mentioned, you testified at congressional hearings was, no, maybe it was about 101, but you pointed out to uh, Daryl Issa that in some ways China's patent system is stronger than America's patent system. And you know, he kind of flippantly threw it away without without any evidence or basis. He just thought he was right because his gut was telling him that. About that moment, I guess, what was that like? Like, you know, <laughs> what was it like testifying at a hearing? You hear a congressman being committed to something that's clearly wrong. I'm usually brought in as the, you know, as the person for the balance in the hearing because <laughs> I'm, you know, they, they want to enact legislation to address, you know, quote, patent trolls, unquote, or to stop patent holdup or to stop, you know, abusive patent litigation or fix the broken patent system, which all entails eliminating, weakening or restricting patent rights. So I'm sometimes I'm often the person brought in to explain why this is not the case. There's been a slight change in this recently. For the very first time in the last year, I was a witness on behalf of what I think was good legislation, which was, uh, you know, at that time, a draft, a bill that never got introduced to reform Section 101. And then, um, and then again, to in support of the Stronger Patent Act, uh, another good piece of legislation that would bring much needed reform <clears throat> to restrain and limit to basic rule of law principles, the PTAB, as well as do things like return injunctive rights to patent owners and things of that sort. In many other instances, I, I you know, I'm the person that's kind of they are testifying contrary to the accepted conventional wisdom of the congresspersons or senators to on peering before. And it's a fun and interesting experience. Sometimes they're receptive, sometimes they're not. That the, you you need to be respectful, you know, the these the individuals. You, you know, you, you can't go in there being all firebrand and everything. You need to be you know, respective. You have the data. That's the point. You have the data. You, ha- you when you have the evidence and data on your side, you can let the data and evidence speak for itself. That uh, exchange that you re, you know that you identified for those who are watching it may it was compelling because I actually had the data because I've actually published a paper with uh, co-author Kevin Madigan on that details exactly how there are you know approximately fourteen hundred patents we had to correct the data set and the, the fourteen hundred patents that on inventions that have been rejected on one hundred one grounds that patent applications in the United States but have been granted in China and in the United States now. Daryl Issa was like making a joke about that, right? Oh, well, you know, China, the pirate country, and it is a pirate country, but they are developing a stronger patent system to promote their own domestic development of their economy, while at the same time pirating technology also from other countries. So it makes sense, you know, if you understand that um, and if you have the data. But another more interesting kind of exchange that I had with him at that same hearing was he he held up his reprint of the very first patent that issued a patent on a method of making potash that had issued you know in the United States and he said you know I respect the patent system I have this patent on my you know wall and I just quickly pointed out I said well actually under current 101 jurisprudence that patent is probably invalid in fact not probably it is <laughs> I would say with quite confidence it is invalid, which he kind of shocked him like, oh, no, (laughs) he wasn't expecting that. (laughs) So that was a fun point to make. (laughs) Go back to China. I think it's an interesting point. You know, China, from a philosophical standpoint, they obviously don't have much respect for property rights, IP rights, rule of law, you know, the rights of foreigners, of Americans. But on the patent sphere, you do see, you know, American companies can't get Chinese patents. They can't enforce them. How do you reconcile that? You know, obviously, uh, Daryl Issa wasn't able to, but I guess, can you help the rest of us kind of reconcile what's going on? <laughs> As I indicated, right, China is engaging in a concerted effort to expand and boost its own domestic economy. 
So China has been a manufacturing economy. So it's been taking the innovation of the rest of the world and has been manufacturing innovation. And it's kind of, it's now, but it's looked at the advanced industrial economies and it says, we want to be that next. And we want to you know, be a United States or Germany or England next and looked at what we have. And one of the things that we have, as confirmed by the weight of historical uh, economic and, and other studies, is we all have patent systems that provide for reliable and effective property rights protections to innovators. And so for them, it's part of a domestic industrial policy. So they are trying to grow their own innovation economy by providing protections domestically for, for innovators in their country. And pirating technology from other countries, continuing to pirate other technology from other countries as well. But by creating a more robust substantive patent system in their own country, vis-a-vis ours, we have concomitantly weakened our patent system, making it harder to obtain patents under through 101, harder to keep valid patents, again, under 101 and many other things, harder to license patents, given the Supreme Court decisions in Lexmark and Quanta, undermining the uh, what has been a huge, tremendous economic driver of our innovation economy is licensing, the embrace of this division of labor in the innovation economy that goes back to you know Samuel Morse and Elias Howe and Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla, who all embraced this uh, licensing business model. And, uh, you know, it'd be harder to enforce your patents. So you can't get injunctions anymore, really, in the United States. Studies have shown for people who are infringing. And you might wonder, well, what's the problem with that? Well, injunctions are the backstop to licensing. So if you, if you as a property owner can't say no to someone who's coming on to your property, who's trespassing, if there's squatter in your, in, your, in your spare bedroom in your home, you can't get an injunction against that squatter. And the squatter just says, well, I'm just going to pay whatever a government official tells me I have to pay as my reasonable rent. Your house just became devalued as an asset. You'll have a harder time selling your house, engaging in using your house, perhaps if you want to become a landlord and other types of things. And the exact same thing is happening to patent owners in this country. China's been doing the, all the exact opposite with their patent system. You can get injunctions, you get effective damages, you can get patents, you can license those patents. And given that we are in a global economy, you know, it's very easy for capital to flow now between countries. And so innovators are, pay, are paying attention to this. And, you know, in, in venture capitalists are paying attention to this because where the innovation is secured best is where economic activities will happen. It's why the biotech and biopharmaceutical revolutions happened in the United States, because the U.S. was the forerunner vis-a-vis Europe at the time in the 20th century in securing genetically modified organisms, securing the, the, you know, the basic types of, of both methods and products that were being discovered in the early years of the biotech revolution in the 80s and 90s. We were the first country that said, yes, you can get patents on that. Yes, you can secure them with property rights. That, then they can be used as collateral for venture capitalists that can be used for licensing, can be used for, to create businesses and things of this sort, which is what property rights do, which is why you had this explosive growth in this country in biotech uh, in the past several decades. And so given these comparative assessments, you know, people are starting to say, well, maybe China is the place we should be going for protection of our patent system. Now, the problem is, and as you said, right, China is not 100% protective of IP. They, they still engage in, you know, thievery on the international scale. And they have fundamental problems with rule of law <laughs> and other concerns as the residents of Hong Kong are now discovering. So there's a contradiction there. And it's an interesting contradiction as, as to see which one will win out at the end of the day. At some day, you know, at the end of the day, China is going to have to make a decision at some point. What's more important, having patents that function through a rule of law with defined rights that people understand beforehand that can deploy in a free market that's not characterized by government's abuses and patronage and things of that sort, or you know, having kind of a continuing characteristic of an authoritarian regime. In the long run, they're going to have to make that decision. Right now, you know, they have a very robust patent system that's been kind of sealed off from the other aspects of their authoritarian regime such that it's enough of a justification to people to say, well, we, we should go there because perhaps we'll have a good influence on China because they'll see the economic growth, they'll see the benefits of, of the rule of law and the patent system, and maybe that will spread throughout the rest of the country. That's interesting. I want to ask you about the pandemic that's going on and its impact on the IP policy issues. You know, at least my impression is once again, proponents of pan, stronger patent rights are on the defensive. Mark Lemley, who you mentioned, he came up with a open COVID pledge, which made it seem like patent rights are an impediment to innovation and to getting solutions for resolving the pandemic issues because the open COVID pledge, people had to 
give up their patent rights, I guess, those who took it for that. What did you think of that effort? Do you think it has been successful? And overall, the IP debate that's going around? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great topic to end our, our, our interview on, given that we're continuing to live still under this pandemic and the effects of the pandemic. And you're right. So it wasn't just, uh, you know, the open COVID pledge, there have been numerous pledges, all predicated upon the fundamental premise that patents are a blockade. All of these efforts that the government should exercise its marching power under the Bayh-Dole Act, any company should should pledge to get rid of their patent rights. By the way, which if one notices, the only companies that have embraced that have all been high-tech companies and other companies that have no business model or patent work or innovation work in the actual biopharmaceutical space as such, right? which is very revealing. <laughs> so we're happy to say other companies should should devote their, should should relinquish their IP rights. <laughs> um, well, uh, it's funny so, because uh, law professors took this pledge as well, or I don't know. Oh, exactly. yes, law professors do, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they have secret uh, innovation going on. but <laughs> <laughs> And again, it's unfortunate, right? Uh, it's an unfortunate reaction because the response from the biopharmaceutical industry to the COVID-19 pandemic is unprecedented in history. Unprecedented. I mean, COVID-19 will not be a repeat of the 1918 Spanish flu. It won't be. We know that for a fact. We already have some treatments that are, you know, and treatments that are being repurposed from other medical treatments. But there are, last I saw, it was like something like over 400 different vaccine and drug uh, therapeutic treatment trials were underway at this moment. And over half of those were occurring within the United States. Now, why is that happening? That is happening because there is a commercial and technological infrastructure that was invested in and created over the past several decades on the foundation of what I mentioned earlier in response to the prior question of providing a reliable and effective property rights in innovation in the biotech pharmaceutical space, which has provided a basis for there to be massive cooperation, not conflict, but commercial cooperation between companies to share information and data through licensing agreements and other types of commercial arrangements, pools, and things of that sort that have created a foundation by which then the biopharmaceutical industry was immediately able to put into action, right? And kind of an a D-Day type of deployment that we've never seen before in human history in response to a medical crisis or a pandemic ever. Never. And all of this was facilitated by patents, facilitated by the intellectual property system, which has provided a reliable and effective platform for these companies to not just engage in the billions of dollars and tens of thousands of labor hours to create these inventions and to create these insights that have made 21st century life a veritable miracle by any historical standard where we treat viruses and, and, and cancer and diabetes and hepatitis, but that they were then able to use these property rights to engage in innovative commercial arrangements themselves to develop all sorts of private ordering mechanisms, as economists call them, to exchange information and to contract with each other in the marketplace in a way that facilitates information flow, facilitates deployment of products and services to consumers in the marketplace. Property rights as a general principle, this is what they achieve. Property rights are not a blockade. You know, oh my God, property rights in farms, that has been a blockade to the access for food. Therefore, that's why we have so less, so less food today <laughs> than, than uh, we did 200 years or 400 years ago, right? No, exact opposite. And the same thing is true of patents. But, none, but people have this conventional wisdom that no, patents are a monopoly grant that we dangle as a carrot in front of inventors who won't invent. And that's the only thing we care about, the act of invention. And, and then we have to get, and then we have to, and then we as a society create this monopoly blockade as the cost for this care, for getting the benefit of this invention. If that's your whole theoretical framing of how you think patents are, then of course you think we have a crisis. So we have to have an open COVID pledge. Of course you think we have to get rid of these blockades, right? But the exact opposite is the case, right? Patents are like any other property right in the sense that they, is, they are facilitators, they're platforms for innovation, not just the act of invention, but the innovation in the market structures themselves that get these products and, and, and services into the hands of consumers and the benefit of our lives. The history of this country is proof of this. And in fact, there's a really great article, a very short article, it's only 25 pages by a political scientist at Stanford, Stephen Haber, called Patents in the Wealth of Nations, where he just kind of surveys all of the economic and historical 
articles and sort of evidence that shows that the weight of evidence shows that every advanced economy in the country or in the world correlates with having reliable and effective patent systems. Now, he, he doesn't make a reductionist claim. He just says that this is clearly then a factor, just like property rights and contract rights and liberty rights are factors or variables that part and parcel and having rule of law, stable political legal institutions are factors and having flourishing societies. I've been very disappointed with the nature of the policy discussions about patents because the, the immediate response from politicians, from some professors, from activists, right? People who, by the way, weren't like they were before, like pro-patents, like, oh, yes, we should have good, reliable, effective patent protection. But now I'm making an exception to this. No, they were just taking a pre-existing position they had before the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And then they were just using the pandemic to justify their ongoing criticisms and theoretical attacks on the patent system more generally. And, you know, we should be law, you know, lauding the efforts by the biopharmaceutical industry on the basis of their patent rights. Now, the reason why I've been disappointed in this response is because the message that this is sending to, far, to, to innovators in the biopharmaceutical space is, yes, go ahead, invest billions of dollars, you know, the, which is the average cost of sunk cost of R&D behind a successful therapeutic treatment that makes it to market is $2.6 billion. Go ahead and invest tens of thousands of labor hours, right? And the, the next emergency, however we define an emergency, we'll just use that as a policy justification to take away your rights. Well, Imagine if we said that to farmers, hey, go ahead, spend a year tilling the soil, planting the crop, seeds, tilling it, weeding, you know, protecting it, a whole year of sunk cost of invested labor that you had. And, oh, we have an emergency. We're taking all your crops from you. Well, what's that farmer going to do next year? Farmer's not going to make that. Farmer's going to say, I'm going to go do something else. And so the message we're sending to biopharmaceutical companies is, hey, yeah, the work you do is so important so life enhancing, so valuable, we're going to take it. That runs fundamentally contrary to the whole reason why we have intellectual property in the first place. And what intellectual property has done for this country through past crises and through the AIDS crisis. There were tons of calls by activists during the AIDS crisis in the 80s and 90s for NIH to exercise its marching power. And bipartisan administrations in the 80s and 90s, from the Bush to the Clinton administrations rejected these calls on the grounds that this is fundamentally contrary to what the patent system requires, but it's also fundamentally contrary to what the Bayh Dole system was set up to do. It's, it's not consistent with what the marching power actually requires. So I think at this point, we should not be talking about restricting or eliminating patents because that concedes a premise that's false, that patents are a blockade. Patents are a facilitator. They are what make possible these innovations. And we want to facilitate not just these innovations to fix this current pandemic now. We want to make sure we're continuing to facilitate these innovations so that when the next pandemic happens, and there will be another pandemic, that the bio and pharmaceutical industry is, is there with the existing structure it had before this one to then respond in the same way. And unfortunately, the activists and some law professors and the politicians are doing everything in their power to, to make sure that that will not happen. And that's really heartbreaking and, and unfortunate because it's going to cause a, a lot of misery and unfortunately deaths in the future. I'll take the positive from that, that, you know, the patent system that we do have now is at least facilitating this unprecedented response. Well, yes, because of the conditions that have weakened the patent system in the past 10 years, right, haven't yet impacted the type of structures and R&D programs that were put into place. 15, 20, or 30 years ago. But to the extent that the, you know, 101 continues to be what it is, injunctions continue to be, then that, that also will have an impact as well. So it's not just, oh, people should give up their rights, we should engage in price controls or actually confiscate patents, which have been the actual proposals from policymakers with respect to COVID-19 treatments. You know, but these other impacts on the patent system, these will also have an impact as well. Uh, just that these are companies that are engaging in investment decisions that are that have time horizons of 10, 15, 20 years. And so this isn't just about having the proper response. I'm glad you made this point to COVID-19. This is about recognizing that these other ways in which we've undermined and weakened the patent system will also impact our ability to respond to this pandemic as well as future pandemics. And so we should be addressing those as well. Why? Because because not because patents are blockades. Patents are facilitators. They are the key to growing innovation economies and flourishing societies. They're everywhere. 
they underlie everything in our society from coffee machines to cars to, to your pens. This is what's made all of these innovations possible, as well as the obvious things like our computers and our smartphones and our drugs. And we should not be killing this golden goose that has been laying these amazing golden eggs in our society. All right. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Eli. It was a really great discussion. I really enjoyed it. 